Shrimati Bhaktivedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Padita Nam Pavane Bio Vaishnavibyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasade Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare So we welcome everyone to our Bhakti Shastri course. We're studying Bhagavad Gita and today we're going to begin chapter 18. We have three days to complete chapter 18, so it's quite good. We've got time on our side. I have a, a little PowerPoint presentation to share with you to, to begin with and after after some slides, then we'll come back and work with the text, go through the text. Oh. Who is the host? Uh, Maharaj, I am the host. <coughs> so I, I want to sc share the screen. Okay, Maharaj, I think I already made you the co-host, so you should be able to share. No. Okay, let me share it. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Is everyone able to see? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Okay. Bhagavad Gita, Chapter 18. The Perfection of Renunciation. We'll begin with a little revision. Chapter 17. Do you remember three qualities of food in the mode of goodness? Who can give one? Give one quality? Some hands are raised. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj, juicy. Juicy. Yeah, like what we are. Okay. Anybody else? Milk and fatty in mode of goodness. No, you can't say milk. You can't say food in the quality of goodness. Food. Qualities. Milk is not a quality. Sorry, uh, the fatty food, which is the fatty, okay. Of milk. Yeah. Uh -huh. so milk. Okay. Yes. Someone else? Krishna uh, Madhuri Mataji. No, what we really want to hear, what are the particular benefits of food in the mode of goodness? Yes, Liti Karuna Madhavi. Hare Krishna Madhavi Maharaj, it increases the longevity of life. Yes, right. Increase the duration of life. That's one quality, one good quality. Another quality... <laughs> Anybody? Hand raised? Give strength. Give strength. Strength. Yes, right. You need strength, right? You need food. You've got to get some strength to do the work. To do. It's a very important. Physical strength, mental strength will come from a good diet. 
Right? Another quality? Hmm? Yes? Healthy. Oh, yes. It gives health. All right. Yes. Okay. So we've got increased duration of life with strength, health. Anything else? Happiness. Happiness. Yeah. Yes. Right. Happiness. Satisfaction. Satisfaction, yes. It purifies the existence. Purifies the existence, yes, right. Good. Okay, we'll go ahead. Number two. Describe some qualities of austerity of the body. How did we describe austerities of the body? What do you have to do? I'm not able to hear her. not particularly mentioned there as some activity or quality of austerity of the body. Of, of course, we're talking about the mode of goodness. Uh, austerity of the body is Brahmana or the superior like partner. Worship of the brahmanas, worship of superiors like father or mother, yes. Also worship of who else? Worship of spiritual master. Yes, and worship of somebody else. Yes, the most important worship of the Supreme Lord. Right. Any other things we're supposed to do? Yes, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, it consists of cleanliness, simplicity, celibacy, and also non-violence. Oh, very good. Yes, yeah, so you got all of them. Right. And what does austerity of speech consist of? Hmm? Speaking only about Krishna? Hmm. No, that's not particular, that's not mentioned. Austerity of speech was? Truthfulness, Mother. Huh? Is it truthfulness? Yes. We should speak, speak the truth. Something else? Shouldn't be agitating to others, right? Yeah. Uh, should be pleasing and beneficial. Yes, should be pleasing and beneficial. These, these are the qualities, right? So we should know these things, these important points. Okay, we'll go ahead. Oh. So here's the breakdown of the verses, what we have in the 18th chapter. 
the first section talking about acting with detachment that that is true renunciation and brings freedom from reaction and then second section 13 to 18 the, the conclusion of sankhya and vedanta actions directed by the super soul bring freedom from reaction and then we'll hear more about the three modes how so many different activities are in the modes and the influence of the modes on the worker and the activity and so many things all right so you can see it's quite a long chapter 78 texts and there's 11, we put 11 sections here. Okay, let's, let's go back to the text rather than go into this right now. Uh, we'll come back to the PowerPoint. Okay, here's the first text of the 18th chapter. Arjuna said, O mighty armed one, I wish to understand the purpose of renunciation. Tiaga, and of the renounced order of life, sannyas, O killer of the Kesi demon, master of the senses. So Arjuna has put a question. He wants to understand the purpose of renunciation and of the renounced order of life. Sannyas and Tiaga. He wants to understand. What is there a difference? Are they the same thing? So it's it's similar to topics which were discussed earlier in the third chapter and in the fifth chapter Arjuna put similar questions. He wanted to understand about you know buddhi yoga and is it do we have to act or not act? So Prabhupada explains here in the purport beginning the purport actually the Bhagavad Gita is finished in 17 chapters the 18th chapter is a supplementary supplementary summarization of the topics discussed before so you know you're not going to get anything really new here but we're going to summarize everything, we're going to begin with summary, first section is going to summarize the Karma Yoga section. So Prabhupada explains, in every chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna stresses that devotional service unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead is the ultimate goal of life. This same point is summarized in the 18th chapter as the most confidential path of knowledge. In the first six chapters, stress was given to devotional service. Yogi nam api sarvesham. Of all yogis are transcendentalists, one who always thinks of me within himself is best. In the next six chapters, pure devotional service and its nature and activity were discussed. In the third six chapters, knowledge, renunciation, the activities of material nature and transcendental nature and devotional service were described. It was concluded that all acts should be performed in conjunction with the Supreme Lord represented by the words Om Tat Sat, which indicate Vishnu, the Supreme Person. The third part of Bhagavad Gita has shown that devotional service and nothing else is the ultimate purpose of life. All right, so this is the important point. We want to understand devotional service is the, the real point. And then going on, further on in the purport, Prabhupada explains, As in the second chapter, 
a synopsis of the whole subject matter was described. And in the 18th chapter also, the summary of all instructions is given. So we're going to get the summary of all the instructions. So Krishna begins his... Oh, let me see. Oh, wait. There was something else I wanted to show you. Uh, there was something... There was a diagram which is useful to see. Just trying to remember where is it. All right, can everyone see this chart? Yes, Maharaj, you can see that. All right, so you can notice here, we begin from the 13th chapter. In the 13th chapter, sloka number 22, Bhunte Prakriti Jangunan, all right? Bhunte Prakriti Jangunan, Karanam Gunasangoshya Sadasad Yona Jamasu. Right, the verse was talking about how the living entity meets with suffering or enjoyment according to how he associates with the modes of nature, with the material nature. So that point then is discussed in the 14th chapter. The modes of nature are discussed. And particularly 1426 explains that if we do devotional service, then we can transcend the modes of nature. Then the 15th chapter goes on to describe the banyan tree. And on the higher planets, on the higher branches of the tree, who is living there on the higher branches of the banyan tree? Demigods. Yeah, yes, right, demigods. And who's living in the lower branches? Hmm? Demons. Demon, who else is living there? Human beings. Yes, human beings, animals, different creatures like that. They're all living, they're living in the lower branches. So, the 16th chapter describes the divine nature and the demoniac nature. And then the 17th chapter, you, oh, you can see here, the divine nature, 16th, they take, they will accept the scriptures. <coughs> and the demoniac, they don't accept the scriptures, they don't accept Shastra. So chapter 17 then was discussing Shastra, they don't have Shastra, but they have faith. So what happens? If someone has faith, but no Shastra, the result is faith in the modes. But if you add Om Tat Sat, then that faith in the mode becomes bhakti. So this is the main points from the chapters, from 13 up to 17. You can see the progression, and you can see how Om Tat Sat brings about devotion. Although it was faith in the modes, by adding Om Tat Sat, you bring in the element of devotion. All right? Is that okay? Any questions on this? Okay. Yes? Hare Krishna Maharaj. a little clarification. How, like, if it is in different modes, in passion or ignorance, and if you just add Om Tat Sat, then how will it uh, become devotion service? Because Om Tat Sat represents the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Like if we see a like a pure devotion, devotion and all, uh, there is certain 
rules and regulations and all that has to be followed. So if if it is in mode of ignorance or passion, then won't it become that sahijiyas? Well, that point is that when you add Om Tat Sat, you see, when you chant the holy name of the Lord, then you're going to bring about a change, you're going to bring about some purification. Of course, it's not just once chanting, you know, there has to be quality in the chanting, but it, th that's the point, that if you chant the holy name, you can, you can transcend the modes of nature. All right? The spark of devotion can burn up all the reactions, all the past karma, and it can free us from the modes of nature. Even one time chanting the holy name is sufficient to bring a person up to the point of liberation. It's a spark of devotion. It burns up unlimited amounts of sinful reactions. Right? Yes, That's a philosophy. One spark of devotion, one little bit of devotional service, it can change everything. Of course, there's quality in the chanting of the Holy Name, but we're assuming that somebody's chanting the Holy Name with sincerity at the level of Nama Bas, with not deliberately committing any offences. So, chanting at the level of Nama Bas will destroy unlimited amounts of sin brings one up to the platform of liberation. Right? Yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, so uh, if they're performing activities according to that faith, then uh, how will it help them? They're performing activities according to the faith. It's going to keep them in the modes. It's going to be in the modes. But when they add the chanting of the Holy Name, then they bring in the element of bhakti. Okay. Without chanting the holy name, then their actions is in the modes of nature. But when you start to chant the holy name, it's a big change. Right? It's a holy name. It can help us to transcend everything. We were learned, we saw yesterday, we quoted how uh, devotional service doesn't depend on the, on the mode of goodness. You can come from the mode of passion, the mode of ignorance, and you can immediately transcend by devotional service. Right? Devotional service is independent of the mode of goodness. So this is the point, you chant Om Tat Sat and you get freed from the modes of nature, it bring us out of the modes of nature. Of course, we, if we, we have to, you'd have to, we could go more into the, the chanting of Om Tat Sat, there has to be quality, you have to chant all the time, you have to do more chanting, you can't just chant. But even one time chanting, the philosophy says, even one time chanting, if, if it has that quality, it can free us completely from the modes of nature. It awakens bhakti in our heart. Right? Yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, there are two more hands raised. Okay, we'll hear the questions. The holy name of the Lord, yeah, they're both the, the holy Om, Om it, it's also the name of the Lord, right? the sound vibration of the Lord. So there is some definitely potency there. Of course, we chant Hare Krishna because we're following Lord Chaitanya. 
And how much, how much chanting of Om Tat Sat can we do? Could you imagine chanting Om Tat Sat for two hours, you know, like what we do Japa every day? Could we just sit and chant Om Tat Sat, Om Tat Sat, Om Tat Sat? It, it's not the same. We get, it's much more relishable to chant the holy name of Krishna and Rama and Hari. And just tend to chant Om Tat Sat and, I, you know, how much, how much could we do it? So, but the potency is there. It's the name. It's the, the name of the Lord. There is potency in it. Just like Maharaj, in the name of the Lord, the Rama and Krishna, the, their sweetness. Like we're chanting constantly, still we are not feeling boring. But if someone chants this Ayam Tatsa, Om Tatsa, Dam Tatsa, after some time he may feel boring, and it's like yes. It will be, certainly, it won't be so, so easy to chant Om Tat Sat all the time. But, it's not, we cannot deny the potency in the Holy Name. Yeah. Hmm? Yes, the other question? Gadadhar Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Related to the 17th chapter, Maharaj, the division of faith, uh, uh, Arjuna is asking a question to Krishna about the uh, one who following the scripture. So we know in, in, in the world, so many religions, they also have a faith and they also have a, uh, a scripture. So uh, uh, how can uh, uh, people from other religions can they get the ultimate perfection? Or else, like uh, we do in the following of one? Well, it will, depend, it will depend on their jnana and vairag. You have to examine their knowledge of the diff matter and spirit and the controller of both. And you have to examine also their, re their detachment from material sense gratification. How much have they actually freed from the desire for sense gratification? And that, that is the indicator they will go into success or failure. Yes. General, that is like that, right. Okay. Yeah. Is it sometimes we, we, give, uh, also, uh, we, we try to introduce the holy name and they claim, uh, yes, we have the holy name also, the root name of God and uh, about uh, we present the, the glories of the Vedas. Of course, they're not so easy to, to accept because they have their own scripture. Right, they have their own scriptures. Uh, we, can, we can give an example, just like there's different currencies in the world. You know, you have the dollar and you have the pound and you have the, you have the Chinese yuan and you have the Indian rupee. You know, are they all the same value? Of course, you know, you don't get, you can't say, I'll give you one rupee, give me a dollar. You know, it's, it's a big difference between the dollar and the rupee. Why? And there's a difference because it's supposed to be based on uh, gold reserve. I, I understand that nowadays it's more based on oil reserves rather than gold reserve. But anyway, there's some controlling factors which influence uh, the strength of the different currencies in the world. So in the same way, there are different religious processes, different religious faiths, and they each have their own merits. And you have to establish the strength of these faiths based on the gold reserve based on the Gyan and the Vairagya. That will make the difference between the different traditions and different cultures and faiths. You have to examine how much do they actually know and how much are they actually freed from material desire. So we cannot say, you know, only Krishna consciousness has a monopoly on love of God. You know, everybody, other traditions, they, are also, they also love God. They also speak about love of God. Yeah. So we ha we, you have to examine 
how much, how much is the strength of their love for God? And you can understand that by the depth of their, you know, how much have they given up sense gratification and how much do they actually know? So that's how we would understand. Anyway. But we're not against other religious faiths and traditions. I told you the other day, I told you about St. Francis and Prabhupada said, oh, that was real God consciousness. You know, he was a Christian saint and he was speaking about the trees and the flowers as brothers and sisters. And Prabhupada said, this is real God consciousness. And so the monks were very pleased to hear Prabhupada speak like that. That, you know, we, we don't reject other traditions. There's mystics, there's great saints in all these different paths. Okay, we'll go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, so Arjuna's, uh, let's see, text number two. Arjuna's question. No, rather Arjuna asked the question in text one. Now text two is Arjun, uh, the Lord replying. So Lord Krishna explains the difference between tiaga and sannyas, right? The giving up of activities that are based on material desire is what great learned men call the renounced order of life. Right? The giving up of activities based on material desire. This is actually sannyas. And the giving up the results of all activities is what the wise call renunciation, tiyak. So some distinction there. One is giving up activities and one is giving up the results of activities. Of course, the sannyas is meant to give up the activities which are based on material desire. It's not that he's supposed to give up all work or all activities, but he should give up activities based on material desire. And, and the, uh, the tiagi, the renounce, one who's renounced, they give up the results of all activities. So we should understand this distinction here. Prabhupada explains in the purport, the performance of activities for results has to be given up. This is the instruction of Bhagavad Gita. But activities leading to advanced spiritual knowledge are not to be given up. Right? When they think, oh, I'm a sannyasi, I give up everything, I have to give up all activity. So I'm not going to Mongol RT, I'm not going to class, I'm giving, I give up all activities, I don't do anything anymore, I don't do any. No, that's not the idea. You give up the activities which are not going to help us, but we don't give up spiritual activities, we don't give up acts of devotion, right? And then Prabhupada then goes on, there are certain sacrifices to perform to attain a good son or to attain elevation to the higher planets. But sacrifices prompted by desires should be stopped. You know, th these kind of sacrifices are not necessary. This is for material desires. You want a good son or you want to go to higher planets. This is material. So those kind of sacrifices should be stopped. However, however, uh, sacrifices for the purification of one's heart or for advancement in the spiritual science should not be given up. Okay?
text number three. Some learned men declare that all kinds of fruit of activity should be given up as faulty. And yet other sages maintain that acts of sacrifice, charity and penance should never be abandoned. You know, somebody may say like that, you know, I'm sannyasi, I don't do any charity, I don't do any penance, I don't do any sex, I give all that up, I give up all these things. <laughs> well, should they be given up? We will hear. And Prabhupada, in Purpur, text 3, talks about animal sacrifice. Is this something we want to give up? Well, some people say it's okay, some people say it's good, and they say this is Vedic. But, of course, Kali Yuga, we're not, we're not supposed to do these kind of sacrifices. Prabhupada writes in the purport, some say that animal killing should always be avoided. And others say that for a specific sacrifice it is good. All these different opinions on sacrificial activity are now being clarified by the Lord himself. Text 4. O best of Bharatas, now hear my judgment about renunciation. O tiger among men, renunciation is declared in the scriptures to be of three kinds. <laughs> so we heard about faith, three kinds. Now we're hearing also renunciation is of three kinds. And we're hearing directly from Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna himself is describing. So text 5. Acts of sacrifice, charity and penance are not to be given up. They must be performed. Indeed, sacrifice, charity and penance purify even the great souls. So then in the purport, Srila Prabhupada speaks about some different activities which people may think should be given up. And he talks about the marriage ceremony. He says, uh, there are, the yogi should perform acts for the advancement of human society. There are many purificatory processes for advancing a human being to spiritual life. The marriage ceremony, for example, is considered to be one of these sacrifices, it's called vivaha yagya. Now, should a sannyasi, who is in the renounced order of life and who has given up his family relations, encourage the marriage ceremony? Well, Prabhupada had gone to America and he, you know, he was preaching there and he met people, young people were becoming his disciples. But he found out that, you know, they were living with their girlfriends and they were not married. So Srila Prabhupada told them, you have to get married. So who would do the marriage? Prabhupada wanted them to have a, a Vedic marriage. So Prabhupada personally performed the fire sacrifice. Now Prabhupada was a sannyasi. Now usually sannyasis, they won't have anything to do with the marriage. You know, they don't want to see the marriage because their mind may become disturbed, you see. So, uh, but Prabhupada, he had to do the marriage, he had to do the, 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 the marriage ceremony for his disciples so they could get married. Was that wrong? No, it was for their benefit, to help them to advance. In the purport, Prabhupada writes, For most men, this vivaha yagya should be encouraged, even by persons in the renounced order of life. Sannyasis should never associate with women, but that does not mean that one who is in the lower stages of life, a young man, should not accept a wife in the marriage ceremony. All prescribed sacrifices are meant for achieving the Supreme Lord. 
Therefore, in the lower stages, they should not be given up. Similarly, charity is for the purification of the heart. If charity is given to suitable persons, as described previously, it leads one to advance spiritual life. Yeah, it's, it's a great benefit to give charity to a, to a great soul. I was telling about the, one, the Italian man who gave the money to Prabhupada. And, you know, he, Prabhupada blessed him, you could see. He's, he's a very nice devotee. I think he's a spiritual master now. And so that, that when you give some money to a great soul, it's for our spiritual benefit. We can make great advancement. When we sacrifice, make some sacrifice, try to give some service to the souls. We say, Mahat Sevam Dwara Mahur Vimuktes. By serving the Mahatmas, it opens the doors to liberation. All right? So, Prabhupada, some people may have criticized Prabhupada because he's performing the marriage ceremony and he's a sannyasi, but here Prabhupada's explaining that for their spiritual advancement he's doing this. These were young people. Young people, they needed to be married. They were certainly not ready for sannyas. <laughs> okay, so that's text five. Going ahead, text number six. All these activities should be performed without attachment or any expectation of result. They should be performed as a matter of duty, O son of Prita. That is my final opinion. All these activities, sacrifice, charity and austerity, should be performed without attachment, right? So this first section is describing karma yoga, right? You can, the effect of karma yoga. In the purport, Prabhupada writes, Although all sacrifices are purifying, one should not expect any result by such performances. In other words, all sacrifices which are meant for material advancement in life should be given up. But sacrifices that purify one's existence and elevate one to the spiritual plane should not be stopped. Everything that leads to Krishna consciousness must be encouraged. So, when people give charity for Krishna consciousness, when they perform some sacrifice for the service of Krishna, maybe do Sankirtan, or when they perform some austerity for the service of Krishna, Austerity for the service of Krishna may be like coming to visit the holy place and going on parikrama around the holy place and uh, maybe doing fasting on a holy day like on Gorpunima, fasting until the evening. So these kind of austerities, they're very purifying and they qualify a person for devotional service. To make, to take up devotional service seriously. Text number seven. Prescribed duty should never be renounced. If one gives up his prescribed duty because of illusion, such renunciation is said to be in the mode of ignorance. This is important for Arjuna to hear because Arjuna, remember, he was thinking of renouncing of giving up his duty. Arjuna was thinking he didn't want to fight the battle. He thought it was wrong. He was thinking, no, I didn't want, yeah, I'm not going to do it. And Lord Krishna is telling him, prescribed duty should never be given up. And then Prabhupada gives an example in the purport. He talks about cooking. Because some sannyasis, they, they said when they become sannyas, they're not supposed to cook. They're supposed to only take food from somebody else who's cooked. But here in the purport, Prabhupada explains 
Uh, cooking for oneself is prohibited, but cooking for the Supreme Lord is not prohibited. Similarly, a sannyasi may perform a marriage ceremony to help his disciples in the advancement of Krishna consciousness. If one renounces such activities, it is to be understood that he is acting in the mode of darkness. Hmm. Prabhupada would often have sannyasis travel with him, and he would often tell the sannyasi to go and cook, to cook something for him. I can remember how Sasvarupa Maharaj would cook for Srila Prabhupada sometimes, and Hari K. Swami was also cooking for Prabhupada sometimes, and then Ribati Nandan Swami, he was also making, I remember making samosas for Prabhupada, and he would run upstairs to give to Prabhupada, and Prabhupada would tell him what was wrong and how he could improve it. And Prabhupada knew exactly how to cook everything. And he was directing, he was showing the sannyasis how to do it. So it's an act of devotional service. The Mayavadi sannyasis, they think cooking is for sense gratification. I was, one time I, we were doing a, a book fair in a Buddhist country, I think it was Taiwan. So we had one of the books by Kurma, cooking for Kurma, cooking with Kurma. And some Buddhists came and looked at our book, cookbook, and they, they, they scoffed. They said, this is all sense gratification. They could not understand that this cooking is done for Krishna. If you ever go to a Buddhist restaurant, the food is bland, has no taste, you know. Because they say, no, it should, if it has taste, that is sense gratification. Everything should be plain and bland. And the, the Buddhists will make soap. They will make soap without any, without any fragrance. There should, be, there should be no fragrance, no smell to it. Because that's sense gratification. So they have this kind of thinking, you know, that everything is just sense gratification. We should, we should avoid it. But in Krishna consciousness, everything is for Krishna, for offering to Krishna, for the pleasure of Krishna. We cook nicely for the deities to offer to Krishna, not for sense gratification. All right? Go ahead. Uh, text number eight. Anyone who gives up prescribed duties is troublesome or out of fear of bodily discomfort is said to have renounced in the mode of passion. Such action never leads to the elevation of renunciation. Hmm. So Prabhupada in the purport, he says, one who is in Krishna consciousness should not give up earning money out of fear that he is performing fruitive activities. <laughs> so, some, some, in the beginning, in the beginning of our movement, the devotees thought, oh, working in a job is maya, they should give up their job. Satsvarupa Maharaj had a job in the beginning when he first met Prabhupada and he wanted to give up the job. But Prabhupada would not let him. He said, no, 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 you have to work. He said, your working is paying the rent for our place. <laughs> so at that time, for some time, Sasvarupa had to keep the job, keep working, and uh, later on Prabhupada said, now you can give up the job. But initially, Prabhupada told him to keep the job, and Prabhupada also told devotees sometimes, go and get a job to maintain that they have to all work and maintain the temple. And it was only because they had to go to work, they had to find jobs, so then devotees, they, decide, they decided working in a job is not very nice, let's find some other way by which we can support the temple. And they went on Sankirtan and they began to distribute back to Godhead and they got donations and they decided this is much nicer than working in a job. So with Prabhupada's blessing, they gave up their work and they took up full-time Sankirtan. Hmm. So we don't give up 
prescribed duties just because it's troublesome. Just like waking up in the morning, in the winter time, it's cold, you don't want to wake up. But we have to wake up. We have to get up just the same. It may be troublesome, but we have to do it. We don't worry about the bodily discomfort. We, for the service of Krishna, we have to be transcendental, right? So we don't want to renounce in the mode of passion. Going ahead, text number nine. O Arjuna, when one performs his prescribed duty only because it ought to be done, and renounces all material association and all attachment to the fruit, his renunciation is said to be in the mode of goodness. Hmm? Oh, okay. And then in the purport, Prabhupada writes, a man working in Krishna consciousness in a factory does not associate himself with the work of the factory nor with the workers of the factory. He simply works for Krishna and when he gives up the result for Krishna, he is acting transcendentally. So, you may be working in the factory or wherever, but you can be on the transcendental platform. You can be Krishna conscious. It's not that you have to be in the temple and you have to wear saffron dress to be transcendental. No. Whatever, in any situation you can be. But what's important is that you're doing it for Krishna, working for Krishna, without attachment to the results. And you give the fruit of your work for the service of Krishna. You're not attached to the fruit. <laughs> so that's the difficult part. People often work, and they're very attached to their sense gratification. They want to enjoy the results. They don't give. All right. Text number 10, the intelligent renouncer situated in the mode of goodness, neither hateful of inauspicious work, nor attached to auspicious work, has no doubts about work. Text number 11, it is indeed impossible for an embodied being to give up all activities. But he who renounces the fruits of action is called one who has truly renounced. There's an important purport here. There are many members of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness who work very hard in their office or in the factory or some other place and whatever they earn, they give it to the society. Such highly elevated souls are actually sannyasis and are situated in the renounced order of life. So that's an important point, Prabhupada recognizes that somebody may be working in a job, but he's actually a sannyasi, he's actually, he's actually renounced because they're giving the fruit of their work for the service of Krishna. Not an easy thing to do, not so easy, but in the beginning of our movement, the devotees worked like that. They were ready to sacrifice. And even today, there are many, there are devotees who contribute a lot, to give a lot to the service of the movement. Oh. 
text number 12, for one who has not renounced the threefold fruits of action, desirable, undesirable, and mixed, accrue after death. But those who are in the renounced order of life have no such result to suffer or enjoy. <laughs> so someone's not renounced, then they have to, maybe they will enjoy some and they will also suffer. The fruit, the fruit of the actions is going to be there. But somebody is actually renounced, they have no, they don't suffer or enjoy. They just serve Krishna. They're, they're just engaged in the service of Krishna. So you can see the, the first 12 verses describing how Karma Yoga leads to bhakti. Maybe we'll go back to the PowerPoint. We can see the same points described again in the PowerPoint. Can everyone see the PowerPoint? Yes, ma'am. You're able to see it? Okay. So you can see nice illustration here on the right. We have uh, Srila Prabhupada at the time of his sannyas. Prabhupada took sannyas, the person in the center was the god brother of Srila Prabhupada. His name was Bhakti Pragna Keshava Maharaj. And he, had a, he has a temple over in Navadweep. No, he, he's no more, he left the world in, what, he left the world uh, maybe late 1960s or 19, early 70s. But he gave Srila Prabhupada the sannyas. And when Prabhupada took sannyas, this other man also took with him. So two men took sannyas the same day. So, what is the purpose of the renounced order of life sannyas and renunciation jyaga? Is it possible that these two are similar in purpose or even the same? What do you say? Is it possible? Are they the same or not? Well, you can't, that's a harsh judgment to make. How do you know everybody's taking, working for themselves? How do you know I mean, everybody? They have a goal of uh, uh, like either Siddhi or uh, like merging into Brahman. Well, they may not. They may be, they may be Vaishnavas. Not, ev not everybody wants to merge. Some people are devotees. But uh, what Prabhupada did was uh, Yukta Vairagya. That means he was everything in Krishna's service. Not to like deny anything which, cannot, which, which can be used in Krishna's service. But that's not taught just by Prabhupada. That comes from Rupa Goswami. We give the credit for that to Rupa Goswami. And we're following the principle of Rupa Goswami, Yukta Vairagya, right? So Rupa Goswami has it guided like that. So all the Gaudiya Vaishnavas, all the followers of Rupa Goswami, the Gaudiya Vaishnavas, they're all doing like that. But somebody can be a renouncer, he may not be a sannyasi, Right? They don't, they don't have to be a sannyasi to be a renouncer. Are they different from the sannyasi? We just quoted Prabhupada saying, 
people working in the office, in the factory, they're actually in the renounced order of life. Right? Going ahead, the next slide. Let me put. Wise men say, sannyas means giving up activities based on material desire. Tiaga means giving up results of all activities. Conclusion. Someone like to read the conclusion? Conclusion. Give the result of activities by offering them to Krishna and only do activities that are for the purpose of devotional service. For working in this way and offering the fruits to him is devotional service, is purifying and is free from karmic creation. All right. So giving up the results, offering the fruit to Krishna, purifying and free from karmic reaction. So two, two sides, we want with equal in weight, right? On one side, all types of fruitive acts should be given up. <laughs> all types of fruitive acts should be given up. Is that exactly the same as acts of sacrifice, charity and penance should never be given up? Is it, is it the same? What do you say, Chandrika? No, Maharaj. I'm not sure, but... You know, you think it's not the same, huh? Okay. I think so. Okay. What about some men? What do you think? Is it the same? Can we generalize saying that anything with connection to Krishna cannot be given up and uh, which is not connected to Krishna can be given up? I mean, in this, can we generalize, generalize it like that? Yes. Well, you're bringing in Krishna, but you see, we're talking about karma yoga here. This, the concept of Krishna hasn't come in. concept of Krishna comes in at devotional service. We're giving a summary of the first section of the Bhagavad Gita. I'm talking about karma yoga. We're not talking about devotional service. So to bring devotional service into it is not really correct. See, all types of fruitive acts should be given up. Fruitive act, so fruitive acts means things which we do for our own sense gratification. But giving acts of sacrifice, charity and penance should never be given up. If they're done, of course, the sacrifice, charity and penance should be done for the purpose of spiritual advancement, to make spiritual advancement. We don't give charity or do a sacrifice or penance just for sense gratification. At least we shouldn't. Some people may do. They may give charity. You know, they say in India, they say, Ek paisa dega das lak malaya. Oh, I'll give, I will give charity, right? I'll give one paisa and I'll get back 10 lakhs. So that kind of charity, that's not, that should be given up. But sacrifice, charity and penance for the service of Krishna should not be given up. But fruit of acts should be given up. Fruit of act, acts for the body, for sense gratitude. So they're the same. The two sides are the same. Right? Acts of charity, sacrifice, and goodness, purify one, should never be given up. Do these acts as a matter of duty, without attachment to the fruit, and free from material association. You can see here, nice vivafa yaga, fire, fire, wedding ceremony taking place, husband and wife. And here you see, 
Lord Vamanadev putting his lotus feet on the head of Bali Maharaj. So Bali Maharaj gave charity. So that kind of charity, if you're giving to Lord Vamanadev, that's that should not be given up. That's very good. Renunciation of prescribed duties, because they are troublesome or interfere with bodily comfort, is in the mode of passion. So, you can read, what is the Mariji saying? She says, I refuse to bathe until they release a 100% waterproof phone case, so I can text in there. <laughs> right? People want, like to have their handphones everywhere, even in the bathtub. So she, the lady's saying, I need a 100% waterproof phone case, then I can do my texting. <laughs> She's not going to give up bathing. She's not going to give up her handphone. <laughs> Look at this person. Look at this man with his son. You know, so dirty, and living in filth. And he's saying, renunciation of prescribed duties due to illusion is in the mode of ignorance. Yes. If you have to live like that, you know, body's all covered in tattoos and dirty and unshaven. <laughs> this, so, that's, this is a renunciation in the mode of ignorance. For one who is not renounced, the threefold fruits of action accrue after death. All right, so you can see the two fruits, desirable and undesirable. And this lotus, this foot is bringing on top of the man and the nature of this foot is ignorance, avidya, maya, illusion, violence, and also unhappiness. <laughs> so this is the fruits of action which come. If one is not renounced, then you have to suffer these kind of fruits. So one part of the fruit may be nice, the other part may not be nice. And you get something in between. You get the mixed fruit. Good, bad and mixed reactions, like a fragrant rose with thorns. The rose is very beautiful, but the thorns are there just to give you trouble. So like that, material activities, some good, some bad. Okay, we'll go, we'll go back to the Bhagavad Gita because we're going into the next section, Sankhya Yoga. Let's see here. Hmm. So next section, text 13. Would someone like to read the text please? According to the Vedanta, there are five causes for the accomplishment of all action. Now learn of these from me. Read, read that first paragraph of the purport. Perfect. A question may be raised that since any activity performed must have some reaction, how is it that the person in Krishna consciousness does not suffer or enjoy the reactions of birth? The Lord is citing Vedanta philosophy to show how this is possible. He says that there are five causes for all activities, and for success in all activity, one should consider these five causes. Sankhya means the stock of knowledge, and Vedanta is the final stock of knowledge accepted by all leading acharyas. 
Even Shankara accepts Vedanta Sutra as such. Therefore, such authority should be consulted. Read the next paragraph also. The ultimate control is invested in the super soul. As stated in the Bhagavad Gita, Sarvastachaham Vidhisannivishto. He is engaging everyone in certain activities by reminding him of his past actions. And Krishna conscious acts done under his direction from within yield no reaction, either in this life or in the next or in the life of death. All right, so we're going into this. Sankhya. Sankhya means Jnana Yoga. We covered the Karma Yoga part. The first 12 texts were dealing with Karma Yoga. Krishna summarized the Karma Yoga from the earlier chapters. Now, this next section is going to summarize the Jnana Yoga part. Right. Jnana Yoga, Sankhya, analytical study. And so it, it's mentioned here that... Uh, Five items, five causes for the accomplishment of all action. Right, the co what's the cause of action? There are five causes. And the ultimate cause is? What's the ultimate cause? The super, super soul, right. So, this is the summary of the Jnana Yoga section. Right, go ahead, somebody could read text number 14. Shall I read, yes, please read, Maharaji. The performance kinds of endeavor and ultimately the super soul. These are the five factors of action. You know, your voice was not clear in the beginning. Can you read it again from the beginning? Okay, sorry, Maharaj. The place of action, the body, the performer, the various senses, the many different kinds of endeavor, and ultimately the super soul. These are the five factors of action. All right. The five factors of action. We should know these. This is an, an important part of in, information which Lord Krishna is giving us. The place of action, the body, <laughs> material body. Certainly our body will influence the, res the action we perform. If the body is diseased or if the body is physically fit, then it will affect the activity. The performer meaning? The performer means the, the soul, the various senses. Different people, in some sense, they have some senses more powerful than others. The many different kinds of endeavor and ultimately the super soul. So different endeavor will be there depending on a person's mood, his attitude. Sometimes we will make great endeavor and sometimes we did, just have no interest, we don't want to endeavor, we don't want to try. So that will affect also the, the action, the, the result of the activity. At the end of the purport, Prabhupada writes, everything is dependent on the Supreme Will the Super Soul, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Go ahead, text number 15. Someone please read. Yeah, Karuna Sindhu Prabhu. Whatever right or wrong action a man has performs, the body, mind or speech is caused by these five factors. Read the purport. The words right and wrong are very significant in this verse. Right work is work done in terms of the prescribed directions in the scriptures, and wrong work is work done against the principles of the scriptural injunctions. But whatever is done it, uh, requires these five factors for its complete performance. Hmm.
So right, what is right work and what is wrong work? If you do right work, it's according to the scriptures, according to the direction of the authorities. And the wrong work is where we act independently or whimsically without, without proper direction from the authorities. So definitely, obviously, we're going to get different results. We do things the right way. We have to know what is the right way. Yeah, number 16. Therefore, one who thinks himself the only doer, not considering the five factors, is certainly not very intelligent and cannot see things as they are. Purport. A foolish person cannot understand that the super soul is sitting as a friend within and conducting his actions. Although the material causes are the place, the worker, the endeavor, and the senses, the final cause is the supreme, the personality of Godhead. Therefore, one should see not only the four material causes, but the supreme efficient cause as well. One who does not see the Supreme thinks himself to be the doer. So that this, is, this is the point here, that without recognizing the Super Soul, we're thinking we are responsible. But we're only one factor. There are other factors. The place, the worker, the endeavor, the senses, and the Super Soul. So ultimate, the ultimate factor is the will of Krishna, the Supreme Lord. So in everything we have to see the hand of Krishna. All right, text 17. Someone else like to read? Yeah. One who is not motivated by false ego, whose intelligence is not entangled, Though he kills men in this world, does not kill, nor is he bound by his actions. So why is this important for Arjuna? Madhuji, you read, can you tell yes. us why is this significant for Arjuna? Why is it important for Arjuna? What, like, I didn't actually exactly got. Yeah, I mean, why is Krishna explaining like this, particularly? He kill, may kill men in this world, but he's not bound by the actions. So it's an important point oh. in the mind of Arjuna. I mean, uh, Krishna wanted to say that if, if he's doing the activity for the satisfaction of as prescribed by the Lord himself, then actually he's not killing, he's doing his prescribed duty of being the Kshatriya. But then if he is wanting to, like in the, the previous verse how it was like, one who sees himself to be the, you know, the cause, but then he's not seeing it fully. Supreme, uh, efficient, uh, the Supreme Lord is also the, is the cause of uh, the, uh, these five factors, his super soul is the main, cause, so that has to be seen. Yes, and what is the example Prabhupada gives in the purport? That is not bound by the actions. Prabhupada gives an example in the purport, at the end of the purport. Soldier killing uh, under the command of the uh, superior officer, he's not judged. And, uh, but if he just goes on, on his own and tries to kill people, then he will be punished. Right. Yes. Thank you. So independent action, not encouraged. Mm. Prabhupada's personal activity and responsibility arise from false ego and godlessness or a lack of Krishna consciousness. So it's, it's an important point 
in Krishna consciousness, you know, people often become independent. They want to be independent. They don't realize how much trouble they're getting into. Better to stay dependent, stay under the control of the authorities. All right, go ahead, text number 18. Yeah. Knowledge, the object of knowledge and the knower are three factors that motivate action. The senses, the work and the doer are the three constituents of action. <laughs> All right. So this is the introduction to the next section. We're going to hear about knowledge, the object of knowledge and the knower. We'll hear also about action, the senses and work. And the, and the doer will hear how they are influenced by the modes of nature. Text 19 continues. Can someone please read text 19? Yeah. According to the three different modes of material nature, there are three kinds of knowledge, action and performer of action. Now hear of them from me. Mm. So Prabhupada's purport explains in the 14th chapter, three divisions of the modes of nature were elaborately described. In that chapter it was said, the, modes, the mode of goodness is illum illuminating, the mode of passion materialistic, and the mode of ignorance conducive to laziness and indolence. All the modes of material nature are binding. They are not sources of liberation. Even in the mode of goodness, one is conditioned. So, often we don't appreciate that. We have to also transcend the mode of goodness. All right, so now Krishna is going to analyze knowledge. We're going to hear knowledge in the modes the different modes of nature, how knowledge also is influenced by the modes of nature. There's knowledge in goodness, knowledge in passion, and knowledge in ignorance. Would someone please read text number 20? Shall I read, Maharaj? Please. Uh, text 20, translation. That knowledge by which one undivided spiritual nature is seen in all living entities. Though they are divided into innumerable forms, you should understand to be in the mode of goodness. All right. That, that knowledge, one undivided spiritual nature, is seen in all living entities. Though they are divided into innumerable forms, so this, this is a, a very special kind of vision to see like that, to see the living entities, to see that they're all one, but at the same time different. Sometimes we speak about unity and diversity. The Prabhupada explains the purpose of our Krishna consciousness movement. There's a purport in the Bhagavatam, and he talks about how he said the leaders of the Mayapur the leaders of ISKCON should all come every year to Mayapur and they should meet and they should discuss how to create unity in diversity. And so you, this verse is something, is like describing unity in diversity. One undivided spiritual nature, though they are divided into innumerable forms. So living entities exist in so many different forms, but ultimately we're all spiritual, we're all parts and parcels of the one Supreme Lord. Prabhupada in the purport, at the end of the purport of text 20, it said, differences are perceived in terms of the body because there are many forms of material existence in conditioned life, the material force appears to be divided. Such impersonal knowledge 
is an aspect of self-realization. So this is impersonal knowledge. There's no, no, there's no description of the Supreme Lord yet. We're simply describing, describing the, the spiritual nature. Going ahead, text 21, describe knowledge in the mode of passion. Someone read? Yes, 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 Prabhupada. That knowledge by which one sees that in every different body there is a different type of living entity you should understand to be in the mode of passion. In every different body there is a different type of living entity. Right? If we make a distinction between the different living entities this is the mode of passion. I, 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 was t I think I told you about in Christianity they have the concept about animal souls and human souls and plant souls. The soul in the, they say the soul, some, some people, not everyone, but some people they try to explain like that, that there are different souls in different forms of life. Or sometimes they would just simply say there's no soul in the animal and the soul is only in the human body. So Prabhupada explains, or rather Lord Krishna is saying, if we make a difference between different living entities, this is the mode of passion. Maharaj, can I ask a question? Please. In this purport, it is also said the body is itself the soul, and there is no separate soul beyond the body. According to such knowledge, consciousness is temporary. So this this is also a concept of mode of passion. Yes. The, the the body itself is the soul. What do they they well just like in Buddhism, the Buddhists they have the concept well. Sometimes they have the concept that there's no soul, but other times they will have the concept that the soul is material and the soul can also be annihilated. You don't find that in Buddhism they preach about any spiritual energy. They say the body is material and the soul is also material, everything is material, and ultimately nothing, nothing is real. So here also, the mode of passion, what's described as the mode of passion, the, the body is itself the soul. And there is no separate soul beyond the body. We say, of course, that there is a soul, and that the, there is a separate soul beyond the body. The soul leaves the body. But people in the mode of knowledge, at least knowledge in the mode of passion, denies this. They say that with the death of the body, everything is finished. Remember professor, that Professor Kotovsky in Moscow, who Prabhupada met in 1971? He was saying, Swamiji, at the time of death, everything is finished. Prabhupada had been telling him about the soul leaving the body at the time of death, but this professor of Asian studies could not accept it. And no, no, everything is finished the time of death. So this is knowledge in the mode of passion and we'll hear text 22, knowledge in the mode of darkness or ignorance. Someone please read 22. <laughs> and that knowledge by which one is attached to one kind of work has the all in all without knowledge of the truth and which is very meager is said to be in the mood of darkness. All right. So attached to one kind of work as the all in all. 
without knowledge of the truth. Prabhupada's purport, the knowledge of the common man is always in the mode of ignorance or darkness, because every living entity is in conditional life is born into the mode of ignorance. One who does not develop knowledge through the authorities of or scriptural injunctions has knowledge that is limited to the body. He is not concerned about acting in terms of the direction of scripture. For him, God is money, and knowledge means the satisfaction of bodily demands. Such knowledge has no connection with the absolute truth. It is more or less like the knowledge of the ordinary animals, the knowledge of eating, sleeping, defending and mating. Such knowledge is described here as the product of the mode of ignorance. In other words, knowledge concerning the spirit soul beyond this body is called knowledge in the mode of goodness. Knowledge producing many theories and doctrines by dint of mundane logic and mental speculation is a product of the mode of passion. And knowledge concerned only with keeping the body comfortable is said to be in the mode of ignorance. So, very nice summary of this section given by Srila Prabhupada. Right. Knowledge in the mode of passion, all mental speculation and philosophies, and knowledge in the mode of ignorance, just simply make the body comfortable. Just so long as we get food, we can eat, we can, oh, that's, we're, we're, we're happy, satisfied. And, and you know, we, we may say, well, isn't that, all right, is there anything wrong with that? Anybody like to answer? What's wrong with that philosophy? Somebody said, you know, I just want to be comfortable, and just so long as I'm comfortable, I get three meals a day, I'm satisfied. Anybody can respond to this? What's wrong with that? What's wrong with just, want to, I just want to be comfortable, I just want to eat properly, I'm satisfied. Anyway, you said we should be satisfied. You said we should be cultivate satisfaction like a brahmana. We should be satisfied. I'm satisfied just so long as I eat. I get my food. I've got my home. I've got my bed. I'm happy. What's wrong with that? Someone can respond? It is equivalent to animal animal life, eating, mating, depending on the. So it is like animals only we are going to live by doing all those things. Oh, you're saying I'm an animal, huh? <laughs> no, Maharaj. Animal, yeah, you're 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 very correct. Of course, that's right. This is animal life. Just eat, sleep, mate, and defend. So, what's it? What are we supposed to do? The human life is very, very precious. It is a gift to reach this level. We have done so much of the things. So we have to utilize this human life to get the self-realization, to understand the self-realization, to understand the supreme personality of God. Mm -hmm. If not, again, we are going to go back to animal on animals' life only. Yes, thank you. Very good response. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Right. So this is knowledge. You see, now there's the, the knowledge for people on the level of animals, and there's knowledge for people who are a, a little bit above animals, but just mental speculators, just enjoying their mind and theories and, and the and there's and you've got on the topmost platform you've got the knowledge of the transcendentalist or the devotee 
they can understand the spirit soul, they can understand the spiritual aspect of life. So different degrees of knowledge. Someone said to me the other day, work is worship. Work is worship. Right? Have you heard that before? Work is worship. Everyone heard, anybody not heard that before? So what will you, how will you respond to that if somebody says to you, work is worship? I don't know, I don't know, this Lord Krishna, he got Arjuna to kill all these people. He incited, he encouraged Arjuna to go and kill all these people. You're telling me that's worship? Yes, Maharaj, because it was told by Krishna himself that Arjuna should kill all these it is your duty because these are that is my instruction. So he has to do prescribed duty. Kshatriya, as a Kshatriya, it says dharma to do that work. Mm -hmm. Because he himself did not go for really war or anything. It, he was instigated. He was brought to that position and he it is his duty when he was called for fight, he has to fight. That is his prescribed duty to do. Very good. Yes. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj Dandavan. Uh, so Maharaj, I would defend him by saying if you think work is uh, worship and is all in all, but work is also binding, right? There is three kinds of uh, work, we, uh, the reactions to work, that is a karma, uh, uh, like a, a positive action, a karma, a karma, and uh, a negative action and uh, no, no reaction which is performed in bhakti. So. If he is saying work is worship, then he will also need to suffer for whatever good or bad reactions he is doing. But uh, he will not. He will never get uh, freedom from his actions and reactions. He has to come to the point of bhakti and understand that devotion service to Krishna can can actually free him from the bondage of his work. Mm. All right. Very good. Yes. By working for Krishna. No reactions to work. Arjuna was worried that if he fought, he would be, you know, he will have reactions from the, from his action, from fighting in the battle, he would suffer sinful reactions. So by hearing this knowledge, he can understand how he can be, he can avoid the reactions of work. Okay, we're going to go on to the next section. We'll hear about action and the modes. 23. Someone please read. Yeah. Damodar Dina Pan Prabhu. Can you read, please? Yes, Prabhu. That action which is regulated and which is performed without attachment, without love or hatred, and without desire for future results is said to be the mode of goodness. All right. So some standards here for action in the mode of goodness. It should be regulated. We want to be regulated. We, we talk a lot about this in Krishna consciousness. Regulation. Regulation coming to the morning program. Regulation and chanting. Regular study. All of these things. It's good for us. Regulated in eating habits also and sleeping. These things are all good. An action which is performed without attachment, without love or hatred, 
and without desire for fruit of result. So this, these are harder things. <laughs> without attachment, without love or hatred, we, we have feelings, we, 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 we do carry this feeling, different feelings for us, with us. So we have to be careful. Just to read the purport, regulated occupational duties as prescribed in the scriptures in terms of the different orders and divisions of society performed without attachment or proprietary rights and therefore without any love or hatred and performed in Krishna consciousness for the satisfaction of the Supreme. Without self-satisfaction or self-gratification are called actions in the mode of goodness. And then 24, action and passion. Someone read? But action performed with great effort by one seeking to gratify his desire and an acted from the sense of false ego is called action in the mood of passion. Can you go on? Read 25? Yes, sir. The action performed in illusion in disregard of scriptural injunction and without concern for future bondage or for violence or distress caused to others, it is said to be in the mood of ignorance. Hmm. You can read the purport, Prabhu? Yes, sir. One has to give, up, give account of one action to the state or to the agent of the Supreme Lord called the Yama Dutas. The responsible work is destructive because it destroys the regulative principle of scriptural injunction. It is often based on violence and distressing to other living entities. Thus, the responsible work is carried out, carried out in the light of the one personal experience. This, this is called illusion, and all such illusory work is a product of the mode of ignorance. Thank you, Prabhu. So, work, the action the, can be the mode of goodness, the mode of passion, and the mode of ignorance. Action in the mode of goodness was described, regulated, without attachment, without uh, too much attachment and without desire or hate, without too much feeling. But in the mode of passion, just as we would imagine the effect of the mode of passion, great effort. Actions in the mode of passion are often like that. Great efforts are required. And a strong sense of false ego. We really want to gratify our senses. We're very attached. It's the mode of passion. And now action in the mode of ignorance. Just the opposite of the mode of goodness. It's going to be irregular and it can be violent and the co it can, there can be a lot of distress for people and totally against the teachings of the scriptures. We don't, they don't even care about scriptures, they laugh about that. So people who are atheistic, they will do like that. They have no care for scriptures. They don't care about others. They can give distress to others. They don't care. Atheism in the Kali Yuga is very prominent. I, I know some devotees who preach in, in Australia, in Ca Canberra, at the Australian National University there, and they have a Krishna club, or they did have, it's temporarily suspended just now, but in the past they had a Krishna club there, and there was a group called the Atheist Society. So the Atheist Society, they come, 
and they use the same facilities which the, the devotees use. So when the atheists come and they see the devotees there doing kirtan and chanting, then the atheists, they really, oh, you know, they scorn and they mock and they, and they say so many nasty things. They have no feeling, no concern about others. There's no question of humility or respect for someone who's an atheist, <laughs> right? People who are atheistic, they're demoniac. And you can see the, the kind of behavior, the pride, the arrogance, the anger, the harshness. It's all there where people are atheists. Okay? And maybe we could st stop there today. We can go on. We have to hear about the worker. We still have to hear about the worker. We're, we've heard about knowledge and we've heard about action. Next one we'll hear about the worker. Are there any questions or comments? Anyone? People who follow this the logis and the and so on, so they do mental speculation. So their knowledge is uh, in a mode of uh, in goodness or in passion. People follow what process? Either yoga, system, or they speculate about the supreme. So what is that called? In a goodness or in passion? Well, speculate about the supreme. They simply speculate according to their own intelligence, they're not guided by any authority? Yes. Well, that would definitely be the mode of passion or ignorance. Actually, I had heard one person uh, who was giving a lecture about super soul. So basically, uh, he was a follower of Ashtanga Yoga. Uh, so I just uh, got to hear when I was passing through. So he was just telling that you can consider anybody as super soul, either Krishna or Hanuman or anybody. So that is not according to scripture because we know only Krishna is the super soul. Mm. Well, sounds like he was encouraging other people to take up the meditation process. He didn't want it to be sectarian. So he said, he's telling them, you can keep your religious tradition and also meditate. So he said, you can think of the super soul as Prophet Muhammad, you could think of him as Jesus. Yeah? He said like that? Earlier, basically Krishna or Hanuman or whoever you want. <laughs> Hanuman or, yeah. Yeah, people have these ideas, they have these different conceptions. But it, it, in some ways, it, it was a little good, he understood there's something, there's some super soul, that he understood there are two souls. There's the individual soul and the super soul. Did it he? seems like. No? Seems like. Seems like. Mm. Yeah. People, uh, Astanga Yoga is a meditation process and if he was following the authorized process of Astanga Yoga, they do meditate on the Super Soul. And it's described in the third canto of Srimad Bhagavatam in the teachings of Lord Kapila because Lord Kapila teaches Sankhya Yoga. Now the primary part of Sankhya Yoga is knowledge but the secondary part of the Sankhya Yoga is the meditation and they follow the Astanga Yoga process of meditation. So it, it's, and of course it's also there in the Bhagavad Gita in the sixth chapter, the Astanga Yoga process and meditation on the super soul. So if, so, if somebody is really serious to understand the process of meditation and do meditation on the super soul, they should read 
Bhagavad Gita, they can read scriptures, but it sounds like this person definitely just speculated himself. He has his own ideas that you, oh, it can be this, it can be that. And where is he taking this from? He's taken it, maybe he had a teacher who told him that, but that teacher was not an authorized teacher. Any authorized teacher, how is it, what is the qualification for the authority of a teacher? He has to be guided by scripture. They have to support their statements with scriptural evidence. So, maybe this person who is teaching Astanga Yoga, maybe he had a teacher who was unauthorized, who was not following scripture. Or, Yes, Maharaj. Unfortunately, he has many followers. Yeah, that's right. You get the people who are cheaters, they get many people who want to be cheated. They don't want the genuine process, they don't want to pay the price to understand what is the actual proper process, so they'll take any genuine, any, any nonsense thing and they'll, you know, they'll make it very popular. But we, you don't judge the success of something just by the number of followers they have. The teacher may have many followers, doesn't mean he's a good teacher, doesn't mean he's v valid. It just means, you know, he's, he's, means he's a good cheater. And you get many people who want to be cheated, many people who want sense gratification, they want to meditate and they want to think I'm God or they want to think, you know, anybody's God, the super soul can be anybody, you can meditate on anyone. It's all nonsense, all bogus. So, we're not impressed. In Prabhupada's time, when Prabhupada was at 26th Second Avenue in the beginning, 1960s, there was a yoga teacher nearby. And the people would go there and they'd sit with the yogi and the yogi teacher would tell them, now meditate, you are controlling the moon. And they would all sit there, I am controlling the moon. I said, now meditate, you are controlling the sun. And they would all meditate, I am controlling the sun. It's just nonsense. And then after they'd done this meditation, they'd come out and they'd all smoke cigarettes and they'd drink beer and they'd do no all nonsense. No standards, no control, no regulation, nothing. Just stupid. And they're, they're, they're thinking, I am controlling the sun, I am controlling the moon. So ridiculous. So this kind of meditation is going on regularly. And people were impressed. People actually think, oh, very good, very good teacher. <laughs> They're so stupid. So people want, they want to be cheated. So they get a cheater who comes along. This is a fact. And they don't get any spiritual progress. They don't feel any change, they don't feel any improvement. No question making spiritual advancement. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, yeah, any other comment, question? Uh, we have Hindu account to follow up as we discussed in text number 22, uh, the people in the mode of ignorance, they say that, uh, yeah, we are happy, we are satisfied with whatever we are having. We discussed and uh, we uh, had the response for that one. So if at all those people, like those people are there, I, have, I know many people like that, they say that we are satisfied whatever we are having. They are happy with their eating, meeting, sleeping and defending. And they say that, no, we also worship Krishna, we go to temple, but they do not have the specific method or anything. They believe in Krishna, that's it, we can say. So what kind of response we should give them or we should we preach them or say anything to them about Krishna or uh, what is the real method of Krishna worshipping or anything, Maharaj? 
Well, they, they say they believe in Krishna, they have some faith in Krishna, they have some attraction to Krishna. And yes, then you want to try to introduce maybe a Prabhu, one of Prabhupada's books to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you can also invite them to come to the class when there's a, when there's a lecture on the Bhagavad Gita. You bring them to the program, let them attend a lecture on Bhagavad Gita, let them hear. What I like to do, I like to give them the book and let them see if they can actually read the book and understand it. And if they try to read it, even they cannot understand it, but if they try to read it, it's a good sign. And certainly you'd want to give them prasadam and tell them this is Krishna prasadam. Mm. And when there, when there are festivals at the temple, you want to bring them to the temple. Mm. Try to yeah, get... I have, I have tried Maharaj, but they are not so much interested in these activities as such. Like uh, coming to the temple, like uh, I tried them to bring to the temple. And uh, they came, but it was, they are not so like happy or uh, just for my sake they came and they visited the temple, they had the prasadam and all but they were not very enthusiastic about it or to know also. Mm -hmm. yes. <coughs> so sometimes it's good, it's good if you can have a like a Bhakti Briksha program, mm -hmm. okay. Bhakti Briksha program you know in, in someone's home. You know, and you meet there and, and, and you have a little program, informal kind of program with them for an hour. Mm -hmm. That can also be very nice, somehow to awaken them, get them a, a little bit uh, interested, you know. Because something coming to the temple, it can be, it can be difficult for people, you know, they don't know people and they're not comfortable, they're not used to it. They don't feel so happy. So sometimes you do the program at home, you have a program at, at someone's house and mm -hmm. and you have a devotee come to give a talk or something and, and, you, and you do by, like b follow the Bhakti Briksha program, mm -hmm. gradually introducing people to Krishna Consciousness. Okay, I'll try like that. Thank you very much. Yes, any other question? Yeah, Ananda Vilas Guru. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dandavad. Maharaj, we saw in this verses how mode of goodness, uh, cultivation, cultivating the knowledge of the difference between the soul and the, the soul and the body is uh, to cultivate that knowledge is in the mode of goodness. But Maharaj, what about bhakti? Is it transcendental? Like cultivating the knowledge of bhakti and devotion to Krishna, is it transcendental to the modes? Yes, bhakti is transcendental to the modes. But bhakti can also be influenced by the modes. That's also dis yes, that's described in the third canto Srimad Bhagavatam, also Kapila Shiksha. You read about devotional service influenced by goodness and passion and ignorance. Yes, but generally we focus on pure devotion, uh, like Rupa Goswami's nectar of devotion is about pure devotion. We want to come to the level of pure devotion, we don't want to be influenced by the modes. So here is describing the nature of knowledge in the modes, okay, knowledge in the modes, and, and the, uh, uh, what was the other action in the modes? Certainly, action in the modes is quite common. How much we are influenced by the modes when we act. So it's it's good for us to hear. And Prabhupada explains that while we are practicing bhakti yoga, generally we want to be situated in the mode of goodness. And we want to be very careful to try to avoid passion and ignorance. Remember this section is about Jnana Yoga, Krishna is summarizing the Jnana Yoga section. So we want to understand how these different uh, items are all influenced by the modes of nature. Action, knowledge, the worker, they're all influenced by the modes of nature. 
and this will help us to come up to the mode of goodness because we heard about how the mode of goodness is so important that if we can get free of the passion and ignorance then it can make it much easier for us to come to the level of pure devotion, devotional service. It's, it's a challenge to get free of the passion and ignorance. We're so much influenced by it, by our conditioning in the material world. So Krishna is describing all of these different items, how they're all influenced by the modes. We have to be aware, we have to try to cultivate the mode of goodness. So knowledge, we, knowledge is understanding the soul. We heard that also in the 13th chapter, right? Knowledge was described. To knowledge means to know about the soul and the super soul and the, and the field of activities, right? But knowledge in the mode of passion is a different thing. Knowledge in the mode of passion is to see living entities different from each other. Knowledge in the mode of goodness, you see living entities all souls. You see them all souls. But knowledge in the mode of passion, you make distinction. Oh, these people, oh no, they're, they're low class. Oh no, they're, they're high, they're, we're high class, they're low class. Like that, this kind of discrimination is there. Knowledge in the mode of passion, knowledge in the mode of ignorance, no consideration, no care. So it's important for us to understand these different items and how, how much the modes of nature do influence us. People's philosophy, the philosophy which people have is influenced by the modes. And the action, the work which they do is influenced by the modes. Uh, yes, ma'am. Maharaj, but, uh, Krishna already spoke uh, about devotional service between 7 to 12th chapters. So that is why here when he's speaking about Gyan, he does not focus on Bhakti so much, right? Like towards the end, again we see a glimpse towards the end. Am I correct, Maharaj? Well, He's speaking about Jnana Yoga just now, but we're, we're, it's like we're going up the yoga ladder again. Karma Yoga was the first section, the first six verses, first twelve verses even, Karma Yoga, and then Jnana Yoga from 13 up to 17, 18, Kar uh, Jnana Yoga, and we're still discussing the modes of nature are still being described to us. And then we will come and we will hear about devotion. Actually, before the devotion is introduced, we'll hear about the Brahman, coming to the Brahman, and then Paramatma, and then Bhagavan. And then we'll hear the glories of devotion. So this chapter is the summary, everything. So the, the, the devotional part has not been introduced yet, it's coming at the end of the chapter. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj, for summarizing it. Thank you for your answer, Maharaj. Very what, nice insight. Let me see where here. Here you can see the the sections. First section: acting with detachment, and second the conclusion of Sankhya and Vedanta. Actions directed by the super soul bring freedom from reaction. And the, we're on this section, the entanglement of the three modes. So we're still entangled in the modes, we have to transcend the modes. <laughs> and then here, number, section number five, from Jnana Yoga to pure devotional service. So, you know, verse 49 to 55 will bring up pure devotion and then worship, working in pure devotion, surrender, hmm, going on. So the second half of the chapter, we'll hear about devotion. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj, for the detail. Hare Krishna. Any other question? Uh, that's all, Maharaj. I think there are no more. Okay, so we will stop here today. Thank you very much for your time. We'll meet tomorrow again. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj.
Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.